Kishore here from the Global Leadership Excellence Program. Strength tests are widely used by team managers for self-assessment and for team building purposes. And this is why we should take a closer look at the pros and cons of those strength tests. And for this, we're going to take a closer look at Gallup Strength Finder or Clifton Strength as they call it, as this is the most widely used strength test 26 million so far participated. So I'm going to try to give you an unbiased opinion on the advantages of those tests, disadvantages, but also a major flaw, which all those tests have and which keep you from achieving true high performance for yourself and your team and a simple method on how you can fix this. So let's get into it. I don't know about you, but I encountered Gallup strength test the first time in a recruiting process when I was applying for a job with Gallup. And I was so curious about the questions which were asked, which were so different. And of course, it makes sense that they do their recruiting based on their own concept, their own tests and research. And when I joined Gallup, then they told us all about this approach of positive psychology that you should rather focus on what people are good at at their strengths and that they are then far more likely to excel than if you would try to eliminate their weaknesses and this really changed also the way i was looking at people well maybe i was always the positive uh, type of person but since then i focus specifically on the potential of people and this is really a game changer whenever i meet someone i try to understand what is so good about them, what can they bring to the table or, or what are the strengths and I could develop them. I love to develop people, this is just in me. But it really changed the way I'm thinking about people and indeed it's far more productive. But as it goes, then I left Gallup after a couple of years um, in, on good terms, got other opportunities. I was also in the research field around leadership psychology and then I understood, yes, there are advantages to this model, but also disadvantages. And uh, this uh, disadvantages I was researching with my team. Then later, when we started the Global Leadership Excellence Program to have leaders from all over the world achieve high performance and excellence, they also gave us the feedback when they used this tool. And through this, we were able to identify one major flaw all strength-based models have, why you so often don't achieve high performance and excellence. And this is an additional dimension, which I'm going to reveal later in this video, and also a solution so that you can truly achieve high performance for yourself and others. But first of all, I would like to get to know you a little bit. How did you encounter Gallup Strength Test, recruiting process, team building, or for self-assessment, just write it into the comments. This helps me also generate videos more on this topic, which may be interesting to you. So just write recruiting, self-assessment or team building. And don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the bell so that you will never miss a video on high performance again. But let's get into it. I've collected and see um, three major points, which are advantages, three major disadvantages, and then we're gonna move on with our extra dimension, which is missing. So advantage number one. Advantage number one is the simplicity of this test. If you've taken it already, you may confirm it. It's rather easy to take it. It takes 20 to 30 minutes, which is, I think, a good time frame. It doesn't take like one and a half, two, three hours, and you get the results quite quickly. I mean, basically, you do the test and right away get the results. I've seen other tests where you get the results after one and a half days. I don't know what they're doing in a computerized uh, age, but it takes longer. Here you get the results right away. And I think this is a major advantage for this kind of a test. And also that the questions are rather simple. Now, if you've taken the test, you may say, well, not so simple. Sometimes I had to think. Yes, sometimes you have to think. Sometimes it's not so easy to understand the statement, the meaning of the statements, which actually could be a disadvantage because people may have different interpretation of the same statements, which should not be. This could be a disadvantage, definitely. But in general, it's not so overcomplicated. So it is not that you need to have a certain degree, a certain education to pass this test, but it's really a basic, simple approach. This is one advantage. The other advantage is, in my opinion, that it is not a personality test. Now you may say, why not a personality test? <laughs> Isn't it a personality test? Well, no, it is not. It's a talent test or strength test. It analyzes and claims to predict your 
potential you have, the competencies you have. Now, what's the difference? For example, um, personality test would say that I am an introvert. Is this a potential? Is this something I can build out? No, it is just who I am. What does it help me? It doesn't help me. Okay, that's it. Whereas a talent is built out. You can build it out, you can train, you can use it, you can apply it. And this is the major difference. And I've seen with personality tests the tendency to have it more shifting to stereotyping. Yes, okay, we have in both cases a tendency to stereotyping, but here more a tendency to negative stereotyping. Ah, he, she is just the introvert. Ah, he, she, sure, she's the extrovert. Sure, he's the extrovert. But it doesn't help. Whereas here we have this tendency more to have a positive approach. Yes, he is the strategic thinker, but how can we make use of it? Or even worse, the negative stereotyping, what can we expect of a person who's introvert? What can we expect of a person who's extrovert? Sure, constantly talking, no results. Yeah, it is more judgmental. Whereas the other is also judging, but not judgmental in a negative aspect. I hope you get my point here. It's a little bit vague, maybe we could go deeper into psychology. There are different um, definitions of personality and competencies of strengths and talents. But I think you get the point of this negative judgmental of personality test, like DISC or Myers-Briggs and the positive. If you're interested in this, I can also do a video on Myers-Briggs, for example, or on DISC, if you ever took this test. And maybe you disagree with me here on this personality test versus strength test, then also write it in the comments. I love also to discuss and join a nice discussion with you. Okay, this is the other advantage. So we have two advantages. Number one, it's easy simple to do and easily get results and also then that it is a strength-based a positive approach. Now this takes us also to the next advantage which is that the results you get you can apply. It's not just like you are but also explains how you can use it on the job. There are to-dos for you. Gallup also provides to-dos. Also if you read their book it is what can I do with them? How can I work with them? How can I make use of them? The interpretation of those results is in my opinion rather deep without being too theoretical. The opposite is true. It's quite a practical approach. This is another advantage. So you can even without a coaching by Gallup, you can sit down and try to make the best out of it. And it, it works. I've seen people doing this on their own. Works also well. Ah, I said three advantages, but a fourth advantage I mentioned at the very beginning, and this I wanted to mention once more, it is that this test truly creates a positive momentum. If you take this serious, if your team takes it serious, then you can see an amazing change. And this is the feedback I got also from our program members who use this test in the company or for themselves who said, it really changed the way I see people now. We talk with each other, how we do our team meetings. And of course, it also depends on how serious you're about something. This is always part of the equation, but it can be a true game changer on how you see things. So far, so good. Those are the advantages I see. Maybe you've uh, taken the test already and you see more advantages. Just write them also down in the comments. There may be, of course, many more, but I just would like to keep this video a bit crisp to get to the point of the flaws and this major dimension which is missing. But now let's take a look at the three major disadvantages. And here we're not going to take a look into what science says, what the criticism is around the calculation or criticism from the psychological scene, because this would take it a little bit too far. We're going to take a look here at the feedback from people who use this program. If you want to have an in-depth criticism around this tool from science perspective, but also from psychological perspective, then just write it in the comments. I surely love to make another video then for you. But now three major disadvantages which come from the community which uses this. Well, the first major disadvantage is that the results change. What do I mean by this? Well, we see the tendency that you, if you repeat the test after one month or two months again, your strength ranking has changed. Now, just for a recap, Gallup believes that there are 34 strengths and those 34 strengths then are given to you in a ranking order. So maybe number one for me is, for example, strategy and number two is relator. 
being able to relate with people, which I love in my program, for example. Yeah. Or number three is focus. Focus is something. And this kind of strength, they change. Not only slightly, but sometimes in such a way that something which is on top one moves down to top six. Not to bottom, not that significant, but still significant. Yes, this is true. And the reason behind it is that it, of course, depends a bit also on your experience. Which kind of project were you working on? Maybe you had some critical issues and uh, you're more pessimistic uh, in your approach uh, this week just because of some things happened. Maybe you're more tired or you're more, far more optimistic or you had planning session after planning session after planning session. So your answering pattern would reflect this as well. This being said, your talent didn't change within this week, but in Gallup's tests or in the results, it reflects a little bit differently. We just need to be aware of this, I believe, so that it's not an absolute test. It's not like a fever curve. We can say, I've got this temperature. It slightly changes. And thus, if you may find some of your talents not in the top five, although you believe you have them, it doesn't mean that you don't have them. They're all there. They may be not used in the past week and you may use them more in the future and suddenly you get another result. So it's not an absolute test result. The next part of criticism is that the room for interpretation is so broad. Meaning, Gallup recommends that you should focus on your top five, build them out, but also take a look at the other top ten. So also six to ten. Because they may influence the top five. Makes sense, as we just learned, that because of your daily work or your experience in the past week, which was usually on top one may even move down. So you, of course you should also take them into account. But this means that we are already looking at one third of all possible talents. We remember 34 talents and here we're going to take a look at 10 already, which makes it rather broad. And such a broad interpretation and uh, taking a look at such a broad set of talents again makes it rather less specific. Basically everyone can find himself in there if it's true or not. And this is quite a valid point of criticism, I would say. It is not as specific as we learned, which is okay, but still, if it's so vague, it makes it rather unpredictive. But still, I see the positive aspect that you create a positive momentum. Now, the third disadvantage takes us to a major flaw, not only of Gallup's test, but of strength tests in general. And this I discovered when I was doing research on this. And for this, I prepared something for you. So we're going to take a look at it to get a deeper understanding of the motivation aspect behind strength. So now let's take a look at the big flaw, which I was mentioning, which every strength-based approach has, and thus also Gallup Strength Finder or Clifton Strength, as they call it. And actually, it is so easy to spot. And in a few minutes, you will say, that was rather obvious. How could I usually miss this out? But as it usually goes, the most obvious things we tend to miss and then sooner or later fail and wonder why. So let's take a look at our everyday work. There we should use our strengths. And those strengths we could put here on a y-axis and we could rank the strengths which we have based on the Gallup system. For example, in my case, this would be strategy, relator, achiever, etc. Okay, this being said, we also have another dimension. And those are values. Now, values can correlate with strengths but so often they don't do. Now let us take a look what values could be. Values could be, for example, um, making a lot of money. High performance could be a value. Team orientation, perfectionism. Now high performance does not necessarily go together with perfectionism, not necessarily go together with team orientation or family orientation. So the values differ. And values are defined by ourselves, but they are influenced by our upbringing, our cultural background, our education, our beliefs, what we read, our friends, our experience. And they are different from person to person. Now, how to identify the values and to rank them, I'm going to tell you at the end of this video a method which we use at the Global Leadership Access Program. But let us first take a look at the impact of the situation. Now, I had a candidate in my Global Leadership Excellence program who had the situation that 
he had a personal sort of mentee whom he thought to promote in a year from now. And they were working together. And this mentee had very high achiever and maximizer. So someone who wanted to achieve more and more and what he was achieving always to perfectionism. Maybe not very sympathetic, probably it would be a little bit challenging to work with such kind of a person, but based on this talent profile, he was considered to be the right fit for the next position. Now, the member in our program, he shared then what happened. He then suddenly did not want to get promoted. Everything was prepared. They offered him the promotion. He said not. And they said it doesn't make sense because he had Achiever and he had Maximizer. And Achiever, he should actually move on. Then we went to a conversation with this person. And as it came out, team orientation was a high value. The value was not so much on performance in terms of making more money, not in terms of hierarchy, but team orientation. And within the team, he wanted to create high performance. For the team, he wanted to achieve more. But if he would have moved up to another position, this would have been lost. I think this makes sense. And we were able to explain it. We were still not able to promote him, of course, but explain the friction here. Now, let me give you another example. We had the situation where there was a candidate who was an achiever, an achiever very high, and relator. So the perfect candidate for key account management, building out the key accounts. So this person was set to build out the key accounts, but what happened? Relating a lot, very good atmosphere, of course, through this selling here and there something, but he did not really build out these accounts as it was expected. Now, if we took a look at the value dimension, we could discover something. There was not high performance. There was human relations very high. So he was actually happy to develop the human relations, but the value of selling, of making more money was rather here. So thus, although the skills were there, they were not put to use. Now this being said, we actually have four quadrants and the high performance and high motivation we get if we are performing here where our strengths are best used and where our values are. For example, it's not one of my values to make as much money as possible. This is why my company is not a sales machine. It's my value to develop people. This is why I'm doing this video. Of course, we also earn money. Also, I have my people whom I need to support and who want to earn their money. Sure, it's part of the business, but it is not my high value. My high value is to develop people. So I put my strengths to use in a specific manner. And then I also have another segment, which is where I have my strengths, but I will not put them to use to make money. So I am rather here creating low momentum. You don't have to worry about me. It's not that we're filing bankruptcy, of course. <laughs> we make our money, but I am not driven. So if someone says, I'm going to pay you 10,000 euros more. No, it even happened just recently that uh, consulting project. I was sitting there with the client. We were working together half a year already and no progress on the client side. I looked into the client's eyes in the meeting. It was a personal meeting, three people sitting there. I told them, I'm going to quit this contract. Why? Why? What happened? I'm earning money on this. Our company earns money on this, but we don't develop. This is against my values, against my values. So this can even happen. So this being said, we also have another segment, which is, of course, where I have values, but I don't have the strengths. So maybe it is my value to build out relations. And I believe in human relations, but I'm rather clumsy if it comes to dealing with people and people's emotions. We all know this kind of people among our friends and acquaintances. We usually have a person who's very, very eager to have close relations, but is rather clumsy in this. So this is also here, which is not a do about nothing. So high energy, low results, high energy, low results. And of course here, there's no energy, no results. So this can be totally ignored. So what we need to do now 
is that we need to make sure that people are working here in the high performance quadrant as much as possible. Of course, as much as possible as values can't always be met, as I said, we always need to limit negotiate the set of values, but we need to be at least aware of why sometimes someone is not performing at all. And it's not because this person doesn't want to, but because this person doesn't see any value. But we could also move a step further. We could address the right values. Now let's say, for example, I have a key account manager who is not really selling. Okay, it's got the strengths, but it's not really selling. But it's got people orientation very high. It's got, for example, team orientation very high but money making rather low. I could address the situation, say, see, because of you, the team is losing money. Because of you, Jill and George can't pay off their house, for example, to dramatize. I could appeal to another value to get things moving. So through this, I can actually create a momentum and move people again into the high performance segment without trying to change their values. Because what you will definitely not be able to do is to change their values, but you will be able to address the right values to get movement again. So this is why it is so important to take this into account and not just focus on strengths. And this is the biggest flaw. So same as every one of us has got a different set of talents, we also have a different set and ranking of values. And if we ignore the talents of ourselves, of our team members, we will fail, but we will also not succeed or achieve high performance if we ignore the values. And I told you that I'm going to give you a method on how to identify the values and how to make this whole system work. And for this, I compiled the full approach which we use at the Global Leadership Excellence Program. It is for free. You can download it. The download link is in the description. Download it. Take a look at it. I promise you it's going to be a game changer for yourself and for your team. Now, if one of your values is to help others grow and develop, then maybe you're going to click the share button. Share this video with someone who's dear to you and who could also use this video. Now, let me know your thoughts. What do you think about this approach of value-based management. Does it explain maybe a situation in your company or team where you had the feeling that someone was not really performing, although he or she could, because maybe was he in the quadrant, or suddenly moved to high performance? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, also questions and criticism, because I love to answer all your questions and I love a beneficial discussion with you. And don't forget to subscribe, like and ring the bell. And if you want to increase your network, you can also connect with me via LinkedIn. The link is also in the description. And maybe I'm going to see you in one of my next videos around leadership, team and high performance. And never forget, leading is caring for people. See you next time and good luck.